scenarios for digital content. We have people that are experts in several scenarios, film, industry, uh, animation, video games. And we would like to know um, how are the uh, marketing processes that they develop in each one of those areas and how uh, we can identify or, or if, if they can tell us a, a little bit of what opportunities they can see for novel um, transmedia or um, uh, cross-media uh, um, IPs in the future. Uh, m most of them told me that they don't know anything about transmedia, so thank you very much for being here and be brave. Uh, we'll, we'll try to convince them to, to, give, the, to give us our, uh, their insights. So um, to start, I want them uh, to introduce themselves. They, they will do it better than me. So why don't we start with uh, you, Jari? Okay. Thank you very much, Pablo. So my name is uh, Jari Angesleva. I'm a Finn, but not currently living in Finland, living in Munich. I have like a 20 years international experience in business. I was the uh, co-founder and chairman of the board of Finnish Mobile Association for several years. Also been consulting uh, lots of Russian IT companies when it comes to the uh, internationalization. Been working with one of the operators, consulting a telco manufacturer from the Asia. So lots of different things along the way. And also, uh, this is country number 58 on my list. So I have been 57 countries before Colombia, and this is number 58. So I'm glad to be here. Hi, um, I'm Jamie Gotch. Um, I founded a company back in 2008. I'm in the uh, video game sector, um, more particularly the mobile sector of the video games industry. Um, I founded a company in 2008 um, right at the launch of the iPhone App Store back then when um, it wasn't called the iOS App Store, it was just iPhone. It was before the iPad even launched. Um, and we put out a game called Field Runners. It was a very big game back at the, uh, in that time before the whole Angry Birds and all the other big games that came out. Before the, before the cringe room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, started a company, we were just two guys, and we kind of grew, now we're about 30, and we released a couple games over the last few years. Um, and I, prior to uh, founding um, my company, I created um, a bunch of games in the console space and the PC space, so games for the Xbox and the PlayStation and things like that. So I have about 10 years of professional experience prior to, to my company. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Pierre-Alexandre Labelle. I'm originally from Canada, uh, but I live in New York now. I co-founded a company three years ago called Under the Milky Way. Uh, we work in the film industry, so we work mostly with feature films and feature-length do documentaries. And we provide digital distribution services or content aggregation services for global VOD platforms such as iTunes, Google, Amazon, Vudu, uh, Sony, and so forth. So our role is really to act in between film rights holders, it could be film producers, distributors, or international sales agents, and these platforms in order to effectively distribute films on, on territories where rights are available, obviously, and where the material available uh, allows for local distribution in that country. Hola, buenos dias. Yo soy Joel Breton, y yo soy de San Francisco, California. Eh, ahora vivo en Londres, Inglaterra, y trabajo en una uh, compañía que se llama uh, 505 Games, y hacemos uh, videojuegos de todas las plataformas, uh, Xbox, Playstation, App Store, Facebook, no, todos, todas las plataformas donde hay jugadores. <laughs> y no, yo soy uh, feliz de ser uh, uh, aquí con ustedes hoy. <laughs> Ivan, you have to do it in Spanish. <laughs> How do you, como se dice, sorry. <laughs> Lo siento. Lo siento. Uh, I, I now feel terribly embarrassed that I don't speak fluent Spanish. Um, my name is Ivan. I, I guess, live in Los Angeles now, sort of. Um, this week I live in Bogota. Uh, I sort of... I don't really know how to explain what I do as well as everyone else. I exist at the intersection uh, of several things. So I, I studied transmedia um, at an academic level and then spent several years in advertising and marketing at a digital agency and then spent several years heading digital media for Lucasfilm, for Star Wars uh, and Indiana Jones, which actually led to me working uh, on an Angry Birds game recently. 
Um, and then most recently, I have been working as a film producer and in crowdfunding. So uh, I don't know what I do, but I've tried to generate money in a number of different ways, which I hope will be useful in this conversation. Thanks. Very cool. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, so we'll start with some questions, and at the end, I hope we'll have some time for questions from you, the audience. So we'll start with um, uh, this one. Um, can you tell us a little bit of the digital content business of your expertise? How big are such projects in terms of money, time, and people involved? Sure. Um, I'm going to go back to English if it's okay. Uh, um, yeah, so, you know, the, the video game business is uh, right now experiencing the, you know, sort of what I call the Napster moment where uh, all of our content is becoming, you know, digital. So, um, uh, the, the App Store, for instance, on, you know, Google and, and Apple are, um, are leading the charge there, but uh, also on the, the consoles with like Xbox Live Arcade and uh, PlayStation 3, uh, those have also uh, the downloadable uh, digital games. And uh, with the new consoles that have just been announced that are coming out this uh, November for the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, uh, pretty much every game that's released on there as a physical disc is also going to be available as a digital download. So uh, in, in our business specifically, um, I think the future is obviously very bright for uh, digital content, and it's not so bright for people that are in the physical disc uh, business, uh, retailers, etc. Um, so it's a good opportunity for people that um, are maybe you know creating uh, content because they can cut out uh, all the distribution, don't need trucks to take their their discs to stores anymore, and actually can have just a pretty direct line straight to the consumers with digital content. So in in our business, it's a, it's a very exciting time. I thought you were talking about the film industry there. It's uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty much essentially the the, the same thing um, in the whole of the industry in terms of distribution. Home entertainment has always been a very important driver in terms of revenues for uh, for the professionals and and in turn for for producers to to produce films. And the home entertainment market is really switching now from physical discs, DVDs, Blu-rays, and moving towards digital distribution uh, increasingly. We're not, we're not quite there yet globally. Uh, some countries are more advanced than others. To give you a little bit of an idea, uh, I think most experts agree that by 2017 in the US, the digital distribution of film will have the same value as, as the DVD. Um, so we're, we're still a little bit ahead, ahead of that time. Um, in terms of content monetization, well, when it comes to transactional video on demand, so these are iTunes, Google, and, and, and Voodoo, for instance. These are platforms where consumers actually pay in order to either rent or purchase the film in order to watch it. This is a, a very retailing model, um, which means that these platforms see themselves as big stores, basically. And they take films, they put them in the stores, and they present them to the audience. So whenever somebody buys a unit of the film, they take a percentage, and then they pay royalties to, uh, well, in our case, the distributors, so under the Milky Way, of which we'll take a percentage and then pay the rights holders what is, uh, what is due to them. So that's you know, very similar to, to a, a video distribution model, I said that we're moving from physical to digital. And there's obviously some, some new models that are, are currently being developed, and, and even more than developed. Uh, I'm thinking of Netflix, for instance, just a subscription-based video-on-demand service. And, and this is more akin to, to pay television, so what would you probably know through HBO, from a, from a business point of view. Whereas Netflix will pay a license uh, in order to have the film under service for a period of one year or two years. And then every two years we'll come back in order to renegotiate that license fee and, and so forth. So these are the two main business models that we're seeing in, in, in digital distribution. There is also advertisement-based video on demand you can think of, of a platform called Hulu, for instance. Um, so that's what we're seeing in terms of, of monetization of film in the digital space. Um, so where Joel talked more from a high-level perspective on the game industry, I'm going to speak more um, particularly to the mobile game sector um, and more uh, particularly to the amounts uh, of time and budget and stuff um, that uh, mobile games kind of... Um, uh, share. Um, so 
from my perspective, so I'm a developer and I kind of, we build games um, and we, we're not a publisher, we don't fund people, but we do um, kind of build these games over a period of time and generally for us, we, we take about 18 months to put out a mobile game, which is very long for the mobile games industry, but um, we really pride ourselves on quality um, and because we believe that with all the games that are in the market today, um, it's very hard to stand out, as you know. I mean, the, the mobile game sector has just been booming at such an uh, exponential rate that um, to, you have to have something very unique to stand out. And so we try to do that by putting a lot of time into our games and making them really of a, a very high quality, kind of trying to match what the console space has done and the PC space has done in years past. Um, in terms of budgets, I mean, I guess they widely vary. Um, so games can be done in very short periods of time from anywhere from a couple of months to, like I said here, where we're almost into like a two year time frame. Um, and we spend on amounts of several million US dollars in our investments in these games. But so far they have proved to be very profitable for us. Um, and moving forward, we continue, we're continue. we continuing to kind of pursue that because we see that it's only getting more competitive. All right, very good. So uh, I will so tell a little bit of how the uh, Finnish uh, mobile gaming industry actually came to be and the, uh, what was the uh, biggest uh, uh, change in the, uh, the whole ecosystem. Uh, it goes back uh, pretty much to the, the, uh, the iPhone and when the, uh, the App Store came up. Before that, the Finnish gaming industry was pretty vibrant. We did have like a 60, 80 companies out there, turn over 150 million euros on an annual basis. They were pretty much console focused. They were trying to get to the mobile side as well, but the technology was not there yet. And also one of the biggest reasons that the, uh, uh, being in Finland pretty much far away up there in the north, we didn't have the uh, uh, publishing companies having a present in Finland. They were pretty much having a present in uh, Copenhagen or maybe in uh, in Germany or UK, London, and they were just eyeballing the whole northern part of Europe as a one part of the uh, system. And most often they took the games uh, which they were starting to sell from uh, Sweden or from Denmark, not from Finland. And the biggest change what happened was that the, uh, uh, when we were trying to get back into 2006, the publishers to come and invest their offices in Finland and the, uh, look to, uh, more closely to the Finnish gaming industry. Uh, the biggest change what happened was 2007, the iPhone which came up and then the App Store that we re actually really didn't need the publishers to cut the middleman out of the business, make your own game and put it in the App Store and off you go. Today, totally different ball game. We got like a 2,000 people working in the gaming sector. Uh, expected revenue uh, figure for this year would be 800 million euros. So that's a kind of big jump start from the 2007 back uh, now to 2013. And now what we have seen is that the, uh, of course, the Angry Birds was mentioned here, also the Supercell, uh, Class of Clans, and so on. But the uh, biggest uh, uh, factor was that Finland has always been a mobile country. I mean, uh, we were the guys who uh, figured out the GSM system back in the 1991. The first GSM mobile call was made in Finland. And uh, we also were the pioneers when it comes to the uh, mobile telephony system. So we did have the uh, Nordic telephone system the yeah, Nordic telephone system up and running back in the, back in the uh, 1980s already. So we did have the mobile background with everybody. And then on top of that, lots of gaming experience based on the developers we have and the, all the big events and so on. So that's uh, in a nutshell what is going on in Finland right now. Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking because of the music behind us. Um, I think my answer to this question is, I guess, maybe a little bit simple, so I'm probably not saying anything that, that you couldn't figure out yourself or that you don't already know, but <clears throat> I think from as far back as radio or television all the way through transmedia now, when I look at it, I see sort of maybe four or five basic business models or, or financial models you can use. And I don't know whether you would call these monetization, which I think of as how you make money on content once it already exists, once you've finished making it, or if you would call these funding models for how you get the money that you need to make the content in the first place. But I, mean, I think essentially one model is selling the content. Uh, if you make something and sell it to people, they give you money in exchange for consuming or playing or watching what you've made, that's one. <clears throat> the second I would say is promotional, when you make content that's meant to be given away so that someone will then be aware of or buy something else. Increasingly, marketing agencies especially create content they create 
I, I hate this word, but viral videos, they create web series, and a lot of those things aren't meant to make any money, they're meant to get you interested in something else that will make money. Um, the third, I would say, is, is advertising or sponsored, supported, so that's what most of television has always been, that you get television for free, but you watch advertisements and someone gets access to your attention and so they pay for the content. Um, the fourth, I would say, is kind of new, which is, uh, especially when you consume content on the internet, uh, data is becoming just as important. So sometimes people will pay for the content that you're watching or playing in exchange for a lot of information about how you watched it or where you watched it or how long you watched it for, which is valuable business uh, detail for them. And then the fifth isn't really a model, it's just a combination of, of the other four. Cool. Thank you, Ivan. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit of the funding schemes you know for the digital content of your expertise? And if, if for the sake of argument and, uh, 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 and seeing in the future, how can they be extended to cover other types of digital content? Yeah, so there's, um, there's actually in, in, uh, in games, there's a, there's a couple of models um, you know, that, that are in prevalent use uh, for, for funding of digital content. Um, the, the first would be you know, self-funding um, of a developer that either um, has, has made enough cash from their previous uh, games that they can now invest in their, in their current or future titles. Um, so that's going to be a uh, sort of a self-funding model for getting games created. Uh, the second one would be a developer would uh, go to a publisher that has a nice stack of cash and um, convinces them that the, the game that they want to make is going to be a hit. <clears throat> and, uh, then the you know convinces the publisher to invest their their cash um, in the creation of that that digital you know game, um, and there's actually a a, a new uh, model that's just appeared, and it's not only for um, games but across a lot of uh, digital content, which is uh, crowdfunding, and uh, so this is on sites like Kickstarter, and there are actually quite a few other ones that have now um, spawned from from that model because it's proven so successful, um, especially in, in digital games where you can basically um, go to, the, um, go to the, the world on the internet directly and tell them your idea and offer them you know, maybe a, a special edition a t-shirt with the game once it's created for uh, you know, them putting in $5, uh, put $10, sometimes even up to $1,000 and you'll get like an autographed uh, poster with your, with your game once it's completed. And uh, so this is actually a very interesting model that's developing. It's really just over the last sort of year and a half that it's, that it's uh, come to, to prevalence. And um, every week or, you know, every couple of weeks, we're, we're seeing uh, a new team or studio uh, raise, you know, upwards of a million dollars on, um, on the crowdfunding sites for their, for their digital games. So this is actually a very interesting area to watch. Uh, but the, the predominant methods that I mentioned earlier for, for funding is either self-funding that, you know, again, a developers generated enough cash to, uh, to create their next game uh, themselves. And obviously that's uh, probably an ideal model for the developer because that means they don't have to uh, give up a, a large portion of their uh, revenue. So if, if they can afford to do that, they're going to want, want to, and uh, that's probably Jamie's model. Uh, but my model is more ar around, um, you know, we're a publisher, so we, we go out to uh, developers and offer you know them to, uh, to to fund their games and you know those are the three sort of main ways I can think of. Yep, great. Um, well, anyone who's been involved in the film industry at one point or another knows that producing a film is basically a miracle. Uh, if you manage to get all that money around and, and and to put your financing plan together and end up with a feature film, it's uh, it's quite something. Um, what I want to say about this is what we've seen maybe in the last 20 years of pre-financing models, of being able on the script to go to a TV channel, to go to an international sales agent, who then in turn would go to international markets in order to get MGs and, and, and pre-financing from distributors around the world and bring that money back to the producer for them to, to produce the film. Uh, I think that model doesn't really exist anymore. It does on a very small number of films but most of the films that, you know, that, that we produce in, uh, in countries like well, Canada and like Colombia, maybe not the U.S. majors, which is something else, and I, I, I don't talk about them today, but more about the films that you know, are, are being produced here in Colombia. Uh, what we're seeing is that that model is decreasingly adapted to, uh, 
to that kind of uh, to to film production, basically. Uh, so what does that leaves us with? Um, and I think a little bit like like in video games, I think what we're starting to see is a shift from pre-financing models towards models of distribution and being able to bring back the money from distribution in order to fund and finance the next project and moving towards a distribution distribution model. And digital platforms and di digital distribution is really adapted for this because the exploitation cycles and from the time you put a film online and you get the money into your bank account, these cycles are very small as compared to traditional distribution in theaters or in DVD, where a producer, most of the time, 95% of the time, he won't even see money coming back because he got his MG from the start. When I, an MG, I mean a minimum guarantee, so pre-financing. And normally when you get that money, then whatever happens afterwards is really in the pockets of the distributors and it stays out there and you don't even get real tangible information. So I really think that digital distribution is, is really an opportunity to be, um, to be seized in order to move towards this, uh, this distribution model. Um, I don't think the market right now, in terms of iTunes, Google distribution worldwide, is sufficient, sufficiently structured in order to have feature films produced only for that distribution channel. Uh, you still need to think about theatrical, as, as you still need to think about DVD, you still need to think about television, and, and this is in addition to, 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 to what you think about. Mm -hmm. But the, the great opportunity that it brings is that distribution is now made possible through digital platforms. Um, you know, I, I gave a, a, a presentation a couple of days ago where I was using an example of a Colombian film that we distributed uh, in many different countries. It's a film called Lecciones para un beso. And, and this film was produced here in Colombia, very adapted for a local market. But for an international audience, it didn't, it didn't really make sense. Or at least the producers went out and they tried to sell it internationally. And distributors, well, you know, they're, they're solicited from all parts by a lot of content being produced in many different countries. And even though the film is highly qualitative, uh, that film did not land distribution deals in traditional ways. So the producers came to us and said, well, can we, can we release this digitally? And obviously the answer is yes. And so that's one of the experiences that we did. And, and we launched the film in the US, in Canada, in UK, in Australia, uh, primarily on the iTunes store. And, and it, did, it did fairly well in, in terms of, uh, of VOD numbers. So, so that's the kind of experiences I think that, that are Im important today. And that if there is you know, uh, public funding that needs to be uh, adapted to, to this distribution channel, it's, it's fairly easy to put in place because digital distribution is relatively cheap. Uh, you know, we release Lecciones para Beso in, in all these countries and it costs, the upfront cost is about $1,500. And that's the cost of the encoding of the film. And then we're, we're able to see, okay, how many units have we sold? We recoup that first investment. And then the rest is, is, you know, direct profit for the filmmaker. And since we feel that increasingly this model is going to become important, funding in that sense to help professionals get into the digital distribution realm is, is something quite, quite important. And, and we've put programs in place with, for instance, Telefilm Canada, with uh, the CNC in France, Unifrance, and, and so forth, in order to, to, work, to work in that direction. So, yeah, that's it. So I'm not going to repeat what Joel said because, I mean, he pretty much <laughs> covered most of the funding models, but I am going to add to it. I, I think that one of the things that he overlooked was like there are um, certain uh, countries and um, like the government in particular states in, in the U.S. that actually will provide either tax credits or some kind of a, um, grants to help studios like get themselves off the ground. And um, I know that has been very effective, particularly in Canada. I've seen a lot of studios um, kind of... Uh, appear um, and take advantage of that. Um, but speaking more from the mobile sector, um, like these are really exciting times because um, big uh, companies and small companies alike are really on the same uh, level playing field um, as as everyone else as as everyone. So like even small studios are constantly releasing very major successes on very low budgets, and that. Um, right there itself is helping them fund their future products. Um, and that's how we started. We were very fortunate enough that when we got into the industry, uh, we didn't 
um, have a lot of competition. I mean, now it's getting harder, but because phones, uh, cell phones in particular, mobile devices are growing at such an expen uh, exponential rate, um, there's still a lot of opportunity out there. And so, like, this is a great opportunity if you are thinking about starting a company, I mean, um, and getting into the mobile game sector, um, I would highly encourage you to do so because there's still plenty, plenty of opportunity. Okay, so uh, uh, my belief is that the, uh, the TV industry as such and the uh, distribution and the whole ecosystem is, is pretty much on the verge of a disruption right now. I think that uh, most of you have heard about the Apple TV. I think that the latest rumor is that it's supposed to come on the, what, next month? Or something like that, and everybody is pretty uh, eager to see how it's going to be. A couple of things I think that it was uh, Pierre who mentioned the Netflix here. So uh, a Netflix very interesting uh, business case, what they did was the, uh, the House of Cards. Have you seen the Kevin Spacey playing the leading role as a governor who wants to kind of want to be a president in the future? Very good. And, but they changed quite a lot of the rules with this pretty, uh, uh, which, which were pretty dominant in the, uh, that type of industry. But first of all, I mean, the, the whole, uh, um, all episodes were released immediately. So you can watch whenever you want, in basically which device you want, all of the episodes at once. You don't have to wait for the next week on Wednesday evening to watch the second sequel or the third one. So you can watch everything. You can consume the content whenever you want. And that's a kind of, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest thing, because usually uh, everything is uh, bundled up, that you have a this and that channel, and, uh, but then you've got a bunch of others that you really don't want to see. And that's the one thing, if the bundling is still going to be there, I really would like to see that the uh, uh, consumers could swap the, uh, those channels that they don't like with the other consumers. So basically, if you've got a right for this and that channel, you can swap with the other guy, which doesn't like some of the, uh, his channels, but uh, those are the channels that you like, so that you can swap them over, that you can have those channels that you really want to have. The third thing, uh, uh, Timo Vuorensola, the uh, uh, guy who was behind the Iron Sky, the, uh, uh, those uh, crazy Nazis behind On the Dark Side of the Moon, film which was uh, made in, uh, uh, which was coordinated from Finland, let's put it this way. And that was uh, like a crowd finance and crowdsourced film, which I kind of think that the, uh, the Kickstarter was here as mentioned, that I believe that the, it would be very interesting to see that the, there's a quite a lot of, uh, uh, if you think about the business model point of view, there's lots of middlemen in, uh, in the TV industry. And I kind of think that the disruption will be that those will be cut out. And uh, one thing is that I think that there will be a crowd financing also for the film industry so that you don't need the studios to finance or the other guys to finance. You just go for the audience. Okay, I got this and this idea. I got a couple of guys, a couple of screenwriters, a couple of good actors and so on. You get the money from the consumers. You make the film, get them the first rights to see it and so on, and then you just distribute it. And uh, these films are just behind the corner in my opinion. I don't know how we've ended up in this order, but I, I like always having the last word, so this is fine. Um, I, so to, to, everyone's already said most of the interesting stuff, but I'll, I'll add two things. One, um, that I think what's interesting, you, know, you, you mentioned House of Cards, and I think the fact that Netflix, which started as a service just to distribute other people's content, has realized that they need to have their own content or they really have nothing special to make people choose them over the 50 other choices is sort of a broader trend. What's, what's interesting is that there was a time not too long ago when the only people who wanted to spend money on content were content companies or distribution companies. And now, it, it seems to me that just about everyone is in the market for content. Coca-Cola wants to spend massive amounts of money to have original content that you'll pay attention to. Netflix wants to spend massive amounts of money. So the, I don't think there are ever, have ever been more buyers for content than there are right now, which is exciting. Uh, you also mentioned Iron Sky, and, and I was going to encourage anyone who's interested in crowdfunding or crowdfinancing, Timo, who directed that movie, is actually doing a presentation just after this one nearby, and I believe some of us are going over to that, so if you don't know where to find it, feel free to, to walk over with us. But um, what's, what's interesting is actually my most recent project was working on a Kickstarter-based movie in the United States uh, called Veronica Mars, which ended up raising, you know, you said sometimes people give up to $1,000. We, we had a few donors who gave up to $10,000. Uh, and we ended up, over the course of 30 days, raising almost $6 million United States currency, which was at the time unprecedented, but is already becoming sort of a, a new experimental model. Spike Lee did one only a, a few months after we finished ours, and it creates kind of a new space. 
but what's, what's funny about that, and I believe Timo is going to talk about this in 20 minutes, uh, is that there's, I think, even behind that, another model that's coming in addition to crowdfunding, which is kind of the idea of crowd investment. Uh, because when we raised $6 million for our movie, one of the most common questions we got in the press was, you're going to make all of the money off of this movie, but you're making it on the five and $10 and the $20 of, in our case, 90,000 people. If your movie does really well, are they going to get some of that money back? Why shouldn't they get the profit? Uh, and interestingly, the United States, I think, is going to be behind almost everyone else in the world in figuring out how to do this because there are laws that make it very difficult to allow hundreds of thousands of people to invest in a single thing and get returns. But I know one of the things Timo is going to talk about is this idea of, in the very near future, uh, a lot of countries, I think, are going to start allowing miniature investments. So you could invest $10 and you might only ever make 50 or or $100 back if a movie does very well, but it will become a little more self-interested. So right now, crowdfunding only really works if you personally like the thing that you're funding. If you say, well, that's a movie I would want to see. And that's a, that's a limited number of people who want to give money. But if it turns into a system where you say, oh, I don't care about that movie, but I think a whole lot of other people will and that's good for me, then you may start seeing a lot of systems where you can give money to anything you think will make you money. Very cool, thank you. This will be a fast question because many of you told me that you don't have any idea. Uh, so what opportunities do you envision for cross-funding between animation, video games, and other types of digital content? Come on, Ivan. <laughs> I'll just get this over with then. Um, I think what's, what's interesting, I mean, transmedia and, and working with all of those different spaces is kind of, of what I do more than, than any specific field like film or video game. And I guess the one thing I find most interesting right now is that transmedia, when it works to make money, often works because people are very interested. They want more than just a film or they want more than just a video game because they get very excited or invested in, in the entertainment or the content you're making. And I think what's interesting is, you know, at, so recently when I worked at Lucasfilm, we make film there and we make animated television series and we make video games or we did make video games through LucasArts. Um, and increasingly we found that all of those different groups could share things they were making with each other. So if a video game made a 3D animation, that could potentially be used as the basis for something on the television show. Or if the movie, there were a movie we were shooting, you know, had a lot of great set photography, that could suddenly be turned into a book that people could buy if they really loved the movie. Or things that have only ever been behind the scenes, like production art, suddenly became more content that could be monetized. So I think the level of interest that's there and the number of assets that are there that can potentially be turned into money or something that can be sold to the audience is a lot higher as all of those groups and media platforms start to work together. Yeah, I think, you know, a, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, what we're doing in the games business right now is, uh, is, is sort of franchise creation. Uh, and so, you know, when we greenlight um, a new game, what we're looking for is something that, you know, has, well, has um, the ability to cross over from from the games business if it becomes a successful hit for instance sells millions of copies and becomes you know sort of a, a global phenomenon uh, because then you know you have the opportunity to turn it into perhaps a, a television show and uh, or you know a feature film uh, definitely a book or an electronic book uh, is um, is is possible so when we're looking at uh, new franchises a lot of times now we're we're looking at it not in terms of just one game, but you know how many sequels will this particular game uh, be be capable of producing, and is it you know possible to turn it into a serial uh, you know down the line, um, and it's not the you know we, we won't look at every. A game like that, because clearly not every game has the potential to do that, um, but certainly there are some that that appear um, so that that have that potential, and obviously those are those are very attractive. You know, when we set out to fund a game, uh, and we see that it you know has a potential to be a, a it's got a great story, for instance, that you know would be a feature film. Um, it's it's. Uh, most most video game movies that have been made to date have really been not so great uh, in a kind way of saying it, uh, but uh, we we keep trying, <laughs> and I think that uh, I think that one day we're going to get it right, <laughs> and uh, hopefully soon. So you know we we continue to look at at games and and sort of you know from a, from a step back uh, and say okay well we could you know make this game and make a few million dollars with it. But you know, what if what if uh, we could also turn it into a Saturday morning cartoon, uh, like Sonic the Hedgehog has done, and you know, Super Mario Brothers have done? Uh, but but clearly, you have to make that thing a, a hit game first, and that's the the first you know foundation that you'd have to to build it on. Yeah. 
Sorry, so yeah, to, to add to that point, um, and actually to point to a non-United uh, States company, Rovio has, this is exactly what Rovio is trying to do with Angry Birds. They actually have, have said on record that the mobile game was just a way of getting into everybody's life and everybody's house. There's a very good article um, that you can probably find on the internet from Fast Company magazine about Rovio's plans to dominate the world, but they've said very openly that they plan to be much bigger than Disney, and Angry Birds is on its, they've already announced a movie, um, they've announced a Saturday morning animated series, they have fruit snacks, they have comic books, they have a fair number of games, they have cookbooks, and I've actually read that in Finland they're, they're setting up free playgrounds all over the country and they're hoping to, wow, fishing bait, that's, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> But, but it's interesting because Angry Birds is not a very deep brand. You know, there's not a lot of story there. There are some people, some birds, and they're angry at some pigs. And so over the next few years, it's going to be interesting to see how far you can go with a very thin yeah. brand idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, from a, from a film industry perspective, I mean, when I look at film, I always think of, on the one hand, entertainment, and on the other hand, creative, creative filmmaking. Um, and I think from the enter entertainment part of it, uh, I think my, my co-panelists are in a very good position to, to share some very good ideas of how we could you know, take a film and bring it out of the film sector and put it into video games or into mobile applications, into you know, a lot of things that happen out there. Uh, but when it comes to creative filmmaking, uh, I think there lies a real challenge. Uh, you know, if you take authors, uh, Lars von Trier, you know, you're not going to do the... The, the melancholia iPhone app like it doesn't it doesn't really work and and that's what that's what I think is really really challenging for the film industry and I'm sorry I don't have any answers for this today of how can these new distribution channels and new places where artists can express themselves how can that come on come together into something very very tangible um, from a very highly creative and, and, and you know, a sort of a sharing a, a vision uh, point of view. Uh, but I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there that are much more creative than I am that <laughs> will, will come up with solutions for that. But yeah, it's my contribution. Um, so uh, there's already a lot of established franchises out there that um, are, that, that came before the whole um, mobile explosion. And so there's a lot of these companies that are looking to bring their franchises to mobile because, as we just said, um, you know, it's a way to get into everybody's home and a way to get into, like, just to raise the brand awareness, um, even beyond what it was already, um, already had. And so um, now, because of that, all these opportunities exist for studios that, um, like myself, who have put out and released games on mobile that can take those IPs and bring them to mobile as well. Um, and so uh, from a developer standpoint, uh, for us, like we also work with the like animation studios for our own products to kind of help um, advertise and market our products. And we're kind of currently in the process of um, working with an animation studio to build us some trailers to kind of um, really promote our titles that we're going to be releasing in the future. So uh, that adds a lot of value, and uh, particularly for people who are looking to, um, uh, or publishers that are looking to fund products, they want them to become bigger than just the mobile. And so even if they're new franchises, they're looking to get them in front of people in many different ways. And so like one way of doing that is to kind of start um, looking at it and building it from different perspectives. What appeals to people um, on TV and in film is different than what appeals to people in the mobile space. And so like, uh, we use animations to kind of um, appeal to those, those audiences and to get them interested uh, enough so that it brings them into um, buying our products in mobile. Well, this has definitely nothing to do with the animation or the, actually the question with Pablo asked, but the, uh, the one, thing, one thing that I've been wondering now that the, uh, pretty much all, all the uh, entertainment is uh, uh, consumed in the devices, there is a touch screen. And what I really would like to see that everybody knows that there's lots of product placement in the movies so that you can recognize certain brands over there, this guy is having a Rolex watch or uh, the latest uh, iPhone or something like this. Those brands you can recognize, but what I really would like to see is the next step that when I'm uh, at home together with my wife and we are watching from the uh, 10 inch pad, uh, latest uh, house of cards for example if i see like a damn this guy is having a beautiful shirt i pause the movie and i click the shirt immediately amazon open up 
order. That's something I really would like to see. As a matter of what things you see in the movie, you can pause it, you can click it, and you can order it. There's a lots of stuff out there, and I think that this could be a very interesting to see it's, uh, how, from the technical point of view, first of all, how it could be done. But I think that that would be, uh, because people want to buy immediately when they see something, because then you forget about it. You see nice shoes in the beautiful girl in the movie, and you click it, okay, these shoes, okay, this is the manufacturer, here I can order them. That would be great. Um, actually, yeah, just on that point, you're not going to have to wait very long. There was an announcement, I think, a week or two ago that YouTube just purchased two technologies that do that, and they're going to start experimenting with making it so you can actually have a shopping cart on YouTube, and you don't even have to leave the site. You just click on the things you want in certain videos and then pay through YouTube and you get them. Am I the only one, or uh, this makes my head spin, actually, when I think of this, you know, watching a movie and... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and we're, we're actually doing that in online and mobile games. Uh, it's actually, we've been doing that for quite a while. Um, I used to work at MTV Networks in the online games business, and uh, we would make uh, dress-up fashion games um, as sponsored by, you know, different uh, um, stores. And uh, basically, you could play the game, and if you liked uh, the clothing that was in the game that you were dressing up your, your model with, uh, you could click on that item of clothing, and it would open up a separate tab in your browser, and uh, you could actually order that and have it shipped to your house. So we've been doing that in games, and it's a, the technology is actually quite a bit easier there than, than what would be needed uh, for the movie side. Yeah, this is fun. We just can go back and forth. Um, if that happens, I mean, if what you're describing really takes off, you can be sure that you'll also start to see television and video content produced by Calvin Klein, produced by Ralph Lauren. They'll start investing in stories, mainly as a way to get products in front of you. Scary future. Yeah. <laughs> well, for the sake of uh, keeping the schedule, I'll, I'll cut the last question that I had prepared. And I would like to thank our speakers first. <laughs> and uh, while the next speaker shows up, maybe we have uh, time for one or two questions from you, the audience. There is a mic behind the, the camera that you can use. You can ask in Spanish. I'll try to make the best to translate it, or in English, whatever. Joel will tell us what it means. Do you want to just tell us what the question Yeah, is? sure. Uh, you, you can do the question, and uh, puedes, puedes hacerla y trato de repetirla. Eh, quisiera preguntarles eh, desde cada uno de sus pues de, de, de su punto de trabajo como en el, el mundo la piratería cómo afrontan eso y cómo combatirla en el caso de, del director de Game of Thrones él dice que está orgulloso de ser una de las series más descargadas eh, quisiera saber qué okay qué so what do you think sentido? about piracy and, and, and so people think that Paris is is great so the more downloads you get, the better. But what do you think in general about piracy? Yeah. Um, I also used to think that piracy was great. Uh, you know, probably like in the beginning of the 2000s, when VOD platforms were not yet operational, I didn't have a television at home, only a computer. And I was, uh, you know, very savvy of film content. I wanted to watch a lot of films. And a lot of these films were quite hard to find elsewhere. So peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, were definitely a very good source of, uh, of content for me. Um, this being said, now that the industry is adapting to digital distribution channels, I think it's very important to maintain uh, a certain commercial relationship and, and to make sure that people do not exploit somebody else's property without their consent, basically. And that's my stand and my view on, on the subject matter. But, yeah. <laughs> Keep taking my word. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, from the game space, um, well, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, we have been kind of moving and adapting to the whole piracy problem by going towards free to play. So, making games that are free um, and that we sell content uh, within those games and um, different kinds of items that are provide some convenience for the player. Um, so that way, uh, the game's free already, so stealing it is not gonna actually have any kind of effect. Um, but uh, 
I think that um, uh, there's a lot of uh, companies that um, have find, uh, found that piracy isn't, um, doesn't, it does affect sales to a degree, but there are people that would never have paid for the game in the first place. So um, we just look at it as, as though it's just free advertising. Um, we get our game and our brand out in front of people that wouldn't have otherwise have seen it. Yeah, that's definitely one thing which has changed quite a lot. I mean, uh, I think that the, all of us remember the, uh, for example, in the music industry when you bought the LP records, that was your record. You could listen whenever you want to, you could borrow it to your friend, your friend could borrow it to his or her friend, and after that you can resell it. Now in the music industry you have a right to listen to the song, and that's it. You don't own it anymore. You don't have any rights whatsoever. But the one thing which, uh, when it comes to the piracy, I remember uh, being together with uh, Peter Westerbach at the uh, uh, I think his title is a marketing director of uh, uh, Rovio, the Angry Birds guy with the uh, always the fleas on and everything else. We went to uh, China to Beijing first time in the uh, mobile uh, uh, mobile internet conference, which is arranged by the Great Wall Club out there. And he said in the front of the uh, I think there's like a 2,000 Chinese uh, entrepreneurs out there. He said, "I want Angry Birds to be the most copied brand in China." Everybody felt silent. And they wonder what the heck this guy is talking about. But he understood, and I think that now the, uh, um, the success has also shown. Wow. What was that? Mm, okay. We don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Don't, don't talk about I the angry birds. birds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But the, uh, the idea behind what he said is clearly that, that the, uh, you get the recognition. The more people are copying your brand, more people know about it. And of course, there is those people who don't pay for anything but there's lots of people who are willing to pay for it as well. I would, to, to what you just said, I would say there are kind of two kinds of piracy that are worth differentiating. There's stealing, like plagiarism, when a company just copies another company's work and tries to sell it, and I think that's almost never useful unless it makes people want the original thing more. Um, but I think to go back to House of Cards, which you mentioned, Kevin Spacey, uh, who stars in, in that show for Netflix, was recently at a conference in Edinburgh and made a speech that's getting a lot of attention, so you should have no trouble finding the video of this online if you're interested. But he basically said that the television industry is completely screwed, and they're screwed because they don't pay attention to what anybody in their audience actually wants because they're used to having all of the control. So when you talk about piracy and whether it's a, a good thing or a useful thing, um, and this is something I almost got fired from Lucasfilm for saying once, um, I actually think all piracy is really telling people is that they're not making it easy enough for people to get what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. Nine times out of ten, I think if people pirate things that they otherwise would have bought, it's because they don't want to have to pay you know, to watch it once and then pay differently to watch it again later. They want to own something or, you know, HBO's Game of Thrones is one of the most pirated series in a lot of places, and that's because they don't make it possible to buy it. Um, if they did, they would be making a ton of extra revenue. Um, and if you want a, a terrible example of the, since we're talking about futures that are worth being scared of, Microsoft's new Xbox um, got in a lot of trouble. I don't know if anyone heard about this, but if you're familiar with the Kinect on the current Xbox, which is a camera that's, you know, on whenever the, the Xbox is on and pays attention to what you're doing, the next Xbox is supposed to have a Kinect that's always on, even when the Xbox is off, so that you can walk into the room and say, Xbox, turn on, and it can turn on. That's, that's a wonderful future, right? But they, one of the scarier things that they proposed was, since you're not actually buying content anymore, you're licensing it, you're buying the right to watch it or to show it to a certain number of people, they were telling the studios in Hollywood that there would be a future where if I bought a movie from Xbox and someone, I was watching it, that's fine. If I'm watching it with two or three members of my family, that's fine. But since there's always this camera watching us, if seven people were in the room, that's too many. Now I'm showing it to too many people and it would stop playing the movie and say, before you can continue watching, you're going to have to buy more licenses to this movie. That is why people will pirate things because they don't want to deal with those stupid models. Right. Well, we have pretty much uh, talked about the, uh, how to make money out of this industry, but it's also that the, uh, what I would like to stress, I'm also a consumer myself. And uh, every time the consumer, you have to be very careful out there. Uh, we are very clever. The guys who are making the big money, they are even more clever than we are. And as a consumer, what they are trying to do is to put both hands in both of your pockets. So they want to take all of your money. And the thing is that uh, don't get hooked up 
I mean, always want to I, I personally always want to have a cross-platform, so even though that if I change the device, I can, you know, the ecosystem doesn't stay on the one device. I can have my content whenever I want from every, I mean, from any different uh, provider, and that makes me feel more safer because I don't want to be hooked up in one ecosystem and stay over there. Thinking about, uh, I think that the biggest uh, challenge for the uh, uh, Apple actually is that uh, when the uh, products that they're putting out, the hardware is not, how to say, uh, fancy enough, they will lose the ecosystem as well. Because if you don't buy the device, you are not part of the ecosystem. So that's why if you think about Android, well, it's totally different. I mean, you can buy any Android device on the market. If this guy is having a better device or nicer looking, I can buy, buy that one, but I'm still going to have the content. And all these cross-platform uh, guys who are uh, putting from every different device all the uh, content and everything else, chose those one, I mean. It's better to always to have uh, lots of choices and options out there than only to stick to the one. Great. I think I... <laughs> we have time for one more question. Um, buenos días. Eh, quería pues como contarles que en Colombia hay como una mentalidad de buscar casi todo pirata o gratis. Entonces, ¿qué posibilidad ven ustedes de enganchar? Pues también en Colombia funciona como un monopolio de las comunicaciones. O sea, está la televisión pegada al teléfono y el celular. Entonces, ¿qué opinan ustedes de ligar sus industrias, digamos, a un pago mensual por cierta cantidad de películas que yo tenga, a las que yo tenga derecho a descargar, por ejemplo, en el caso, no sé cómo se llama el, el de la mitad. ¿De la qué? No sé cómo se llama él. Eh, Pierre. Sí. Yeah. Pierre Alex. Yeah. Alex. Alex. Alex, okay. <risa> eh, por ejemplo, okay. en el caso de él, ¿qué, ¿qué le preocupa? Pues que las películas se descargan ilegalmente. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo verían ellos un modelo en el que se enganchen, en el que se enganchen sus, como sus eh, empresas a estos monopolios? Entonces, que la gente pague mensualmente por cierto número de descargas de juegos, películas y música. Ok. So, in, in general, in Colombia, we are pretty bad paying things. So, there is, there is actually a shopping mall. If you want to go three blocks from here, you can get every game at 2,000 pesos. So, it's, it's great. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's, it's really difficult to have an industry at, in that way. So, one of the models that it seems that is working the most is uh, paying a subscription for, for a month or for a year. But at the same time, you get this big companies behind those models. So do you think that model will be the future or what do you think against that model? Well, in the, f in the film sector at least, I, I think it's going to be part of the future. I don't think everything will be subscription based. I think there will still be space for, for, for retail and transactional based uh, vi video on demand. Uh, to just come back a little bit before, when you're saying that it's big actors that are behind this, uh, mostly we're talking about Netflix today, which is the the main provider of the subscription video on demand service. The, the, the problem with this is that you need a lot of resources in order to provide a service as such to, to, to a large audience. You need servers, you need you know, bandwidth, you need people, you need, and it costs a lot of money. And again, Netflix, on the one hand, they have a very low monthly fee in order to subscribe to it. I think in the U.S. it's something like eight dollars or so. The so it's, yeah, so so it's very 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 cheap for the consumer. So for another company to come in and compete with Netflix on on that scale, you need to have the same economies of scale. So you need to tap into the U.S. market basically, which yeah, for, for I don't know, like, I'm not going to do that, you know. But <laughs> but but I mean, even I I think it's a real question because when. You know, I think of a country like France that I know, I know quite well, and I know that the pay TV sector in France has been very uh, involved in the production of French films, of which there's about 220 films, feature films produced every year, and, and mostly that's due to regulation from the French state, which states that it's mandatory for, for Canal+, Plus, the, the pay TV channel, to give a certain percentage of their turnover every year into film production into financing local feature film production. And, and that's a big problem because when Netflix comes to France, uh, and most of these platforms, when they come to Europe, they don't base themselves in France. They base themselves in another territory. 
and it's very hard for the local government to be able to impose either quotas or obligations to finance local productions. And, and I, again, I don't have the answers, uh, unfortunately, but, but I think all of this makes it very, um, very challenging if, if collectively we want to keep a very vibrant, uh, you know, creative film industry. That's it. So, uh, I apparently just really like adding to what people say. Um, I, I think, you know, you're right that subscription is going to be a part of the future. I definitely think individual purchasing of content that you want is going to be a pretty permanent part of the future. Um, there's one, one other good example that kind of ties this question back to the last one about piracy, also in the, in the United States, that I think is good. There was a comedian, well, there still is a comedian named Louis C.K. I don't know if he, how well known he is outside of the States, but he did this experiment a few years ago where he had taped one of his own live shows and instead of selling it to HBO or selling it to a subscription service like Netflix, which a lot of people are doing, comedians are giving original content to these places and getting you know, a one-time paycheck for it, he decided he would try this experiment and he set up his own website, you know, no high fancy technology, just his own site, and he said that he would sell a video with no rights management, no protection, no DRM to anyone who wanted it for $3 which he figured was easy enough and cheap enough that there was no reason to pirate. And he, when he announced it, he said, I'm not some huge company, I'm just a guy with two kids. And if you pirate this, you know, I'm not gonna stop you, I'm not even gonna try. But if you pirate it, you're just taking money away from me who made the thing you're liking. You're not taking it away from some big company. And there was almost no piracy of his video and he made, I think, $2 million in the first month on it, which is way more than he ever would have gotten from a distributor for that content. And it's, it's sort of, that's becoming, I think, another trend that will live alongside subscription. There's a, a startup um, that I heard about a few weeks ago called VHX, uh, which is trying to essentially set up a self-serve version of the iTunes store where anyone who has video can upload it and make it available for sale and get 90%, I think, of, of what's being paid for it um, with no copy protection. So it's, you know, I think... Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much uh, to everybody again for being here. Let's thank again our speakers.